Welcome, everybody. I'm so glad you guys are here to join us today for Word Room. Thank you so much. And we are going to continue today's message, the Revealer of Mysteries, number two. We are going to be taking a lot of time in the first few chapters of Daniel, and uh, and I really want to you to grab your Bible with me today and follow along as, as we read. So let's go into our first reading. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled, and his sleep had left him. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dream. And so they all came in, and they stood before the king. And they, the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will show you the interpretation. And he said, King, live forever. Tell your servants the dream. We'll show you the interpretation. No problemo. Okay. The king answered and said, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time, because you see that the word from me is firm. If you do not make the dream known to me, but there is what there is but one sentence for you. you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. Therefore tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can show me its interpretation. Oh. Now the Chaldeans and the wise people were all saying, What? Oh hey, king and they dismiss him and they said this There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. For no great and powerful king has ever asked such a, has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing the king asks is difficult, and no one can show it to the king except the gods, whose dwelling is not with flesh. Because of this, the king was angry and very furious, and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out, and all the wise men were about to be killed. And they sought Daniel, on whom we introduced in our last chapter, in our last message. They sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Now remember, from Daniel, we're going to say this. We're, before we continue, we're going to uh, go back to Daniel chapter 1, and we're going to look at this first, the last part of this chapter. It says this. Verse 17, as for these youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and all wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. And at the end of time, when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief and the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them. And among all of them was found, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom they changed their names to. And Daniel's name was changed to Belteshazzar. Therefore they stood before the king on every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the queen inquired of them. He found them ten times better then all the magicians and all the enchanters that were in his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. When we have the Lord, there's something different about us that separates us from all the people of a similar aspect. If you're a worker or an employee somewhere and you are doing the same job, you can have the same technical skills as 10 people in your division or maybe even 100 people. But the thing about the people that have the Lord is they have an inherent ability that's in them that, that God anoints and it makes them attractive. It makes them have favor with God and man. It gives them inside information. It gives them an edge in every area that they apply their mind to. It helps them even with the learning of learning those skills. It helps them have an unfair advantage. And praise God for that. Because that is by His own grace that God chose. That He wants to give His people a special favor. 
and it's like there are light in the in the in the dark place and i think that's just an amazing thing that is everywhere in life if it's in a classroom that student that has the lord something about them shines there's an anointing there's a calling there's a it's like god being with us we notice from the bible that there was a certain favor that was on david when he played the harp the king who was troubled by evil spirits would feel peace when he would play just having david around was just amazing when david came into the king's presence the bible says that king saul didn't let him go home there was a favor that was found because the anointing was on david he didn't get to go back to his own house and just live a normal life after those days the king kept him in his care there's another example of someone i really love in the bible and it says this in genesis chapter oh go back sorry not that one i think i'll open my app instead there it is Genesis chapter 39 says, So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him, and he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. Now, what is this? Who is it that, he had, that Joseph had favor with? Who was it? The, 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 the Pharaoh? Uh, not Pharaoh. Uh, although he did have favor. It was Potiphar. During the times that even when he was a slave, working in the slave system of the world, God was still rising him up and giving him this favor. And this is the first thing we should know about being a servant of the Lord. There's some people that try to hide that. Okay? And there's a false humility to this. And, and every now and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on false humility. And I've been touching on it here and there. We talked about it from Moses. When Moses was like, Lord, I know I'm able. I know I'm anointed for the task. I know I'm anointed for the skill. I know I'm anointed for the purpose because you made it. But you got the wrong guy. Choose someone else. <sighs> and that Moses thought he was doing actually God a favor. He thought he was doing right by letting someone else choose the task. But it was a type of selfishness if he didn't rise up to the task. How does that apply to you? Some of us, you got what it takes. But you're still waiting for someone else to take the chains, take the reins. You're looking for someone else to be the leader. It's who, who's going to be the leader? Who's going to be the leader? You're, and God's calling you. You're supposed to be the leader. You're supposed to do it something. Some, sometimes, a lot of times... When you're in a place, you're the one that carries the fire. You're the one that carries the light. You're the one that carries the torch. But you're also the one that carries the responsibility. Right? Mm -hmm. And if you don't rise up to that responsibility because you think that, oh, let someone else, then, then what you're doing is you're doing a disservice to your Heavenly Father. Okay? That leadership that God rises you up because of the anointing isn't just so that you can live a good life. It's because God cares about everyone else. Also you, but he cares about everyone else. Let me show you what we mean. Let's go back to our main text. Let's continue the story. We have an angry king, right? This king is mad because he's asking for the impossible. Is he asking for the impossible? Absolutely, right? I would agree. I don't know anybody who could. Even somebody who reads a mind, who could, like just say you have a psychic power. You can read that person, know what that person's thinking. Unless that person's actively even thinking about that dream, that you're not even going to know about that. That's just saying, just say you had a superpower and you can read minds. You, that king would have to be thinking about that dream. Just You can't go back in time and see what the dream was. Okay, Nobody can do that. The, the, they weren't lying. But this king, he has this, everybody's out to get me. And, and, and maybe he comes from that background. And, and, and maybe rightly so, as we're going to read later on, that he's worried about people backstabbing him and maybe murdering his family or something like that. And you're conspiring against me. And, and I think that sometimes people get paranoid like that when you're a king and you have too much responsibility. I don't know if that's from God or it's an evil spirit from the Lord. But that same thing happened to anyone else? Name me. In the Bible, anybody remember who else that happened to? Who had that, everybody's out to get me. <sighs> Mental. It was a king. Saul. Saul. Yeah, it was Saul. Good. If you guys got it, great. It was Saul. Saul was just like trying to preserve his throne that 
he was missing what God was actually doing. God's anointing fell on David, and he could have supported David his life. Even God told him, but he was trying to hold on so tightly to what he happened that it made him paranoid. He even tried to kill his own son. Uh, he even tried to kill David many times. Uh, it was just, it, it was insane. Um, but that was a paranoia. But the peace is always on God's people, right? Mm -hmm. When God is first rising you up in that responsibility, there's a reason why God elevated you. So let's continue. And chapter number two, where we're at, let's go back to number two. The king was angry, furious. And he said, that's it, kill them all. I'm not even going to give them a chance. Just kill them all. So the decree went out and they were about to be killed. So guess what? Daniel sat home. Or kicking back. And they sought Daniel and his companions, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, to kill, to kill him. Daniel, with prudence and discretion, used that favor to speak to the right hand man. And that right hand man, his name is Ariok, okay? the captain of the king's guard. So he spoke to the captain. He, even the captain knows this is wrong. You kill every, all the wise men, where's, where's going to be your governance from? But the king doesn't care. I can do this. I'm doing this all of myself. Everybody's out to get me. He says this. Whoa. Why does the king's decree of the king so urgent? Why does everybody have to die and have to die right now? Why Why? Why is that? And then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel. So even the captain has favor with Daniel. Listen, I have to kill you guys. We have to round up everybody. We have to kill them all. This is what's going to happen. And Daniel went in. And requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. So he said, for, for, give me an appointment. Get me a schedule so that I can go into the king and make the, the matter known. Give me some time. So he has the captain make him an appointment. He has the appointment made. Mm -hmm. However, that happens. Then Daniel goes to his house. Now, he why is this? Now, what is this? Daniel went to his house. And made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, his companions, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he told them to seek mercy. What was this? Why didn't the captain just kill him right away? As well as all the other wise men. What? They're rounding him up. They haven't killed him yet. They haven't killed the people. They're supposed to. But now Daniel gets a chance to go back home. What? To plan his escape? No. No. What was this called, that, 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 the fact that he let them on? Does anybody know? It's a word. When you have a judgment that's about to happen, but God gives you time. Does anybody know the word for that? Grace. That's right, Melody Sun. Good job. Yeah, you're, you're pretty good. You're supposed to let them guess, though. You're the one who told us. Yeah, it's grace. Grace is when you have a judgment that is pronounced, but you have time to get it right. That's what grace is. We're saved by grace, right? The Bible says the soul who sins shall die. We are supposed to suffer the punishment of our sins. But the Bible tells us in Isaiah that the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. Who? Jesus. Jesus now gives us time to get right. With who? To fulfill all the law? No. But to get right with Christ by seeking forgiveness of our sins. The Bible says that Jesus said, Settle matters quickly while you're on your way to court with your adversary. Who does the Bible say our adversary is? Satan. The devil. Satan, yes. The Bible says your adversary, the devil, goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Satan is always looking for us. And Jesus says, get it right with your adversary. Because your adversary will have a legal right to stand before God, which he does in the Bible. Many times he stands before God. The Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren. And he slanders and says, look at them sinning, see them sinning. And God's waiting for us. Remember the discussion that God had with Satan in Job? He says, look, Job's blameless. And, Job, and Satan says, oh, is he really blameless? He's only because you're protecting him, you're blessing him. And so there's, a, there's an accuser of the brethren who's always trying to point at us. But Jesus, when you repent of your sin, Jesus says, yes, but they repented. Here's my blood. Here's my blood. Satan's always trying to do that in a court case to you. Now, let's get back to the message. We know that Daniel received grace. One of the things and signs that you're going to remember and know that when you are walking with God in a favorable way, God's going to give you supernatural grace. And that grace isn't for you to just escape. 
many times that grace that you have is not to escape, but to bring the solution to your community. Okay? If God says, hey, something bad is going to happen, that doesn't mean that you always just have to take that at face value and just say, okay, something bad is going to happen. Many times that's a grace for you to pray and say, God, change the situation. Just like we talked about in our previous messages where Abraham was told by God, hey, something's going to happen to the city. And Abraham said, okay, God, but can you change the situation? And God said, yes, I could. I could. And I can. If, and God, he gave him the terms. He said, if there's 10 righteous people, could you spare the city? And God said, I would. But luckily, there wasn't no, there wasn't 10 righteous cities. Not luckily, you should say. Unfortunately, there wasn't 10. Mm -hmm. But the fact that God does negotiate with mankind is a very wonderful thing. And it's part of his grace as well. So we can remember some lessons from these already, from our first things. And our uh, series is called The Revealer of Mysteries Number 2, A Deep Study into Daniel. When God's favor and anointing is upon a man or a woman, and he rises you up, it's to be a light, a beacon of hope. And if he gives you grace in a situation that normally you wouldn't have favor in that situation, it's generally not so you can run away. It's for a reason. Why did God spare his life? Are we thinking, man, this is a big deal. He had favor with the captain. He has time to go home. Not so he can quickly pack his bags and escape during the night or run away from the calling, but no, so that he can do something. Now, what is that something? It's to find the answer. And is the answer within him? No. But is the answer accessible through within? Yes. On his knees in prayer. The answer wasn't inside of him. The answer was in God. And when we're praying, we can connect to God. And the God will and the God and God will reveal the mysteries unto us. Here's what Daniel said specifically. He said this. He told them, seek mercy from God. Seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this what is it? Mystery. 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 So that his companions so that Daniel and his companions and the rest of the wise men of Babylon, not just Daniel, not just his best friends, not just his few Christians who were here with him, the few godly people might not be destroyed, but that the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Okay. Now, when we look at when we look at Joseph, God raised up Joseph within Potiphar's house, within the prison. And then he raised him up to be the right hand of the king, Pharaoh. That was amazing, right? In the story of Joseph. That happened a long time ago in compared to Daniel. Daniel's there. He remembers those stories. God gave Joseph favor. He has it written. When they go to the synagogues and they would read the books, Daniel knew the stories. But of Joseph, who had favor, was it just for him so that he could live in the nice palace? Who was it for? Somebody tell me. Not Melody. Somebody unmute your microphone. Let's talk about it. Who was the favor for? He got to live in the palace. He got to drive Ferrari chariots with real no, Ferrari. It was for his people, the Israelites, right? The, because the famine was going to hit. It was for his Israel. Yes, yes, you're right. But is there something you might be missing? I mean, his father's home and everything like that. All right, repeat the question. Was there something you, someone you might be missing? You got him, you got his people, which would have been his long lost father he hadn't seen in many years. Okay, who else? His brothers who did him wrong, his relatives. There's a reason I'm asking this. Could have there been anyone else? When the famine was going, let me ask you a question. How long did the famine last? Do you guys remember how long the famine last? Seven years. Seven years. Okay. And it got real bad, right? Real bad. Yeah. The so people, for Pharaoh, maybe? To show him who is God? Could have been Pharaoh. He yeah. Was in control. That's one of them. Anyone else? Brian. Everyone else. Every, do you know that some of us are descendants from some of those families who moved somewhere to move somewhere and they moved and scattered across the world and nations came nations. For thousands of years, we have DNA inside of us that comes back from some of these nations. 
that were dependent on Egypt. All the nations were dependent on Egypt. All the nations. The Bible says that fair, that the Israel, the father of Joseph, said, "Whoa, the famine's everywhere, and we know that there's food in Egypt. So let's go to Egypt." So there's a lot of nations that are hurting around the world. Look at now. It says, "But as for you, you meant evil against you. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about." Is it to this day to save many people alive? It wasn't just the Christians. It wasn't just the godly people at that time. It wasn't just for him. It was for people to come on who he would never meet. It was for people who were not yet saved. For the Bible says that God shines his reign and gives his reign on the just and the unjust. unjust. That's right. He gives his reign on the just as well as the unjust. Let me ask you a question and, 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 and point this out because this is interesting. Many of you are in wealth transfer communities. I, I believe our, our community may be classified as a type of wealth transfer community. People who are, uh, have some kind of tied or to uh, a financial aspect when it comes to prophetic or dreams. The Lord has led that ministry. For example, we do chart room, right? We have, there's a lot of prophetic people in our community. God gives us visions and dreams regarding numbers and prices and a lot of things like that. So we might be a subcategory called, we have a wealth transfer community. Although Word Room is not wealth transfer. Many of you guys are part of wealth transfer communities like JSON community. And you got to think to yourself something very important. Is the wealth just for you to drive your Ferrari? Uh, that's fun, right? If you drive, you get your that nice chariot. I'm sure Joseph had some really nice stuff. I'm sure he had some nice gold jewelry and some nice clothes. Was it just for his family? Is it just so God can save your family and even your local church? Because it was Israel, all his, their wives and their daughters and their sons and their and they're expanding and their servants and their flocks and their herds and all that stuff. And God's prospering them, right? Or the community that he lived in, even the neighborhood. God was blessing the nation of Israel. Wow. No, it was actually that would be a preserver for even generations that to come that weren't even in his community. The wealth transfer community isn't for the wealth transfer communities. The wealth transfer is for the purposes that God will do well beyond those communities. Remember that. Okay, remember that. I'm going to say that just one more time. The wealth transfer isn't just for wealth transfer communities. It's for the purposes that God's going to do well beyond those wealth transfers. It'll be for generations to come. It will be for people who are not even saved here yet. I'm not going to send my money to them. They're not, it's not going to happen. The structures and institutions that you build, the things that you build with your wealth today may actually get them saved later on in the future. Yeah. Okay. Just remember that. All right. Let's continue. Now, he says this. Seek God. Seek God. Seek mercy from God of heaven. God already gave grace time before judgment to seek him. Seek the God of heaven concerning this mystery. That heaven. Seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery. So that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Even though it, those wise men of Babylon would later go on to betray him. And they probably weren't good. They definitely weren't saved. These sorcerers and all these people. They weren't saved. But yet, Daniel is praying for them. So that their lives are spared as well. And then, what a good heart. Now, where could we compare this heart to? That he says, Lord, give me the answer. Not just for me. Which is could be selfish, just only for you, right? But for my companions, and not just my companions, but those lives that are going to try to betray me in the future, even my enemies who may hurt me. Where else had we learned this type of prayer from? Does anybody think of, there's two people in the Bible that, that gave this type of prayer, where we're praying even for those people who are going to betray us or hurt us. Who are those two people? No, no. Jonah, okay, Jonah, that could be one. Who else? That was Job. Abraham. 
Abraham. Job? Yeah, Job. 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 At the end of Job, he prayed for his enemy. He said, "No, I shouldn't say his enemies. His friends who were saying all this stuff that wasn't right." God says, "Now pray for them so that nothing bad happened to you." <laughs> That's Jesus. Said, Jesus is a Jesus is what I was thinking of. There's a few, right? Moses. Moses, yes, Moses is a great example. Remember when Moses was on the mountain and Miriam and uh, Miriam and Aaron got mad? They were like, "How come he gets all the credit? How come he's all this?" And what did he? What did God do? He says he rebuked them in front of everyone. And and that was a great thing. And what there's one more person that wasn't necessarily an enemy, but it was praying for someone besides himself. That was when it was he was asking specifically something. That was not a selfish prayer, and God said, "Wow, that's such a not selfish prayer. I'm gonna bless you with everything you you didn't ask for, and give you what you asked for." Solomon. 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 Good Salomon. job. Good job, Claudia. Good job, Ro. It was Solomon. Solomon said, "Look, Lord, I just became king, and man, it's a big responsibility." I don't need you to come and give me peace on all sides. I, I I don't need you to prevent me from all that war. I I don't need you to give me a lot of wealth in our kingdom. I don't need you to give me even a long rule or a long life. I want one thing. I just want wisdom, so that I do the ministry in a manner prescribed that you want. That I take care of people and others in the way that you want for my life. I, I want to be thinking more about others than I think about myself. And God loves that heart because you know what God does for those people who have that type of heart? He reveals the mysteries. And He's going to reveal more mysteries to you because He understands it's not just out of selfishness. I'm going to give you a scripture right now. And uh, I want you to think about this. And this is going to be found in James chapter 4. Let's just say James 1. Nope. What causes quarrels and fights among you? Is it not that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you don't have, so you murder. You covet and you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly. To spend it on your passions. And then he goes on to say, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, anyone who ever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Now, he's talking specifically about the things we ask for, the thing that we desire. And many of times, those things that we desire, we ask because we ask with the wrong motive. What is that motive? Usually it's a selfish desire, a selfish nature. Lord, give me this just for me. And you often don't get your prayers answered if your prayers are of a selfish nature. But here's an easy way to get many of your prayers answered. Ask for prayers for other people. Because this is the cycle of love. God's love is always encompassing. And it's, yeah, it's a selfish thing. It's wanting something for someone else. Because in heaven, everyone serves each other. In the kingdom of God, everyone's always serving each other. Everything's like a cycle like this. And we give without expecting. But when you're always giving, it, you can't help. It's a principle. It's going to keep coming back to you. When you take this type of mentality to you in prayer, you're going to find that many of your prayers are getting answered because you're praying for other people. You're praying. You're searching the purpose. You're searching your heart. You're searching the root for why it is you're praying for the exact thing. For example, this might be... It, I'm not, I'll use that Ferrari example. I really like the Ferrari example. If we're praying for the Ferrari, Lord, give me a Ferrari, then what can I say to God is my real reason for praying for a Ferrari? I can't really pick up anybody for church in a Ferrari. Okay? What am I going to do? I think the closest I can think of is maybe enter a racing competition, race, win, and give prize money away. But that's a far stretch because most people are going to be not drawing, driving so reckless with their Ferrari if it costs them a lot of money. So what would be the purpose of a Ferrari? Now, I'm not saying you can't have a Ferrari. Again, we're talking wealth transfer people because God made Abraham very wealthy. God made Job very wealthy. God made Joseph really very wealthy. And God makes a lot of people wear very wealthy at times. But there's no real reason why I would have to pray for something like that. Now, if God gives it to me, that's separate. <coughs> if God gives me a blessing, 
That's separate. There's no real reason we need a lot of things. So therefore, a priori really shouldn't be on my list of prayers. If I have a reason to pray for it, if I have a reason to have it, those are the types of things that get God's attention. When And, and here's how what Solomon did. He says, look, I'm not praying for wealth. I'm not praying for the, I'm praying for the wisdom so I can do your work. And so I can do it right and do it in a good way. God said, wow, good job. That's the prayer I want. Now I'm going to give you all the wealth. And God gave him so much wealth. That was, the Bible says silver was as common as stones in the days of Solomon. Silver was as common as rocks in the days of Solomon. Okay, that's a lot of silver, right? We, we barely got a little silver, right? And in Solomon's day, that's insane. So what was gold? Gold was everywhere. He covered the temple in gold. Everything was covered in gold. And God did these types of things because God says, I don't mind the wealth, have you having the wealth when I know that the wealth doesn't have you. Okay? When your purpose of your prayer is outward for other people, then I don't mind blessing you. But when your purpose is only for the prayer for your wealth for yourself, then that's when we start putting it in a stop. It's, if I have a bucket here, okay, and I fill it up with caught water just for me, it's going to stop flowing when it reaches my capacity. But if I drill a hole in the bottom and I start linking it to everyone else's cups, then that water can continue flowing. But once the water stops, everything else beyond my capacity is wasted and spilled and expelled on the floor. Okay? So as long as we keep the flow of wealth going, the wealth can continue to flow and it won't stop in my life or get stagnant. And it's the same with your spiritual gifts, everything that God is awakening in your life. If you keep using your gifts for the kingdom of God's going to keep giving you more. And this is why Jesus said, to he who has, what? More will be given. That's right. To he who has, more will be given. But to he who does not have, even what he has will be no, nope. you know the rest of the scripture. Taken, taken away. That's right. It will be taken away. He who does not have. So if you're asking God, Lord, give me a starter gift. Remember, it's a it's for a purpose. Use that. Here's Joe. Here's David. Here's Daniel, and he's praying. Lord, give me the mystery, something I don't have, the secret. Give me the secrets, not just for me. Not just for my companions, but for the rest of the people. Okay? Others beyond me. Even if they may not be deserving, because those wise men were not deserving. We'll find that later on. Those other wise men were not deserving. And Daniel blessed. Then, the, then it says then in verse 19. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. And Daniel did what? The first thing that God does when God starts blessing you with inside trading secrets, when God starts blessing you with secrets of nature, of science, when God starts revealing to you these great mysteries, which he's doing in our communities, which he's doing in our lives, which he's doing every day, it's amazing what God is revealing. It's just things that's going to help preserve you, things that are going to help sustain you, things that are going to bless for generations to come. When God does these things, what is and God blesses you, what is the first thing we should be doing? Thankful. <laughs> thank the Lord. Yes. Praise, praise and thankful the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yes. All glory to the Lord. Hallelujah. Right? Thanking and praising. Good job, good job, Superfood. Good job, El Camino. See, here it says that Daniel says, let's make this. He just starts singing him a song. He starts praising him. Daniel blessed God of heaven. First thing in the morning he did. Be blessed be the name of God forever and ever. To him who belongs wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. Is it possible for God to have decreed that Sodom and Gomorrah was to be destroyed? Yes. And is it possible that God would decree that Sodom and Gomorrah would not be destroyed? Yes. Sometimes there's conditions, but our prayers and intercessions can change the times and seasons. If there is supposed to be a big market crash, and we hear prophetically the Lord is sustaining the markets at this time for this season, that's something we can remember. We can say, wow, Lord, you actually have the ability to preserve things and change things that are external, even in data. 
Now, luckily, the Lord is going to reveal a lot of that stuff to us, and He has been. But think about it. Our God is able to change even times and seasons. If somebody's supposed to be president, and if there's supposed to be a great judgment that's supposed to happen, the people of God can intercede and seek mercy on behalf of God and say, Lord, can we have more time? Lord, can we go into this? Lord, can you change the times and seasons for this? And God could say, yes, if He wants to. He could say, no, if He wants to. It's not in our power. It's us to, up to us to ask. And we'll see that in just a second when we read about Daniel. Because Daniel acknowledges the limitations on man. And he acknowledged where he ends and where God begins. It says, He changes times and seasons. He removes kings. He sets up kings. And he gives the knowledge to what? To those who have understanding. And what does it take to have understanding? It just takes a desire. Okay? When you start thinking, I, I want to understand. Lord, give me that desire. If you desire understanding, ask God. He'll give you understanding. And then to that understanding, He'll give you wisdom. He'll give you knowledge. To that understanding is saying, how can I, uh, how does this work? How does this work? That's really what understanding is. And then a knowledge is going to be the capacity that's beyond that. So uh, I should say understanding is your capacity to know something, how something works. My son doesn't have the capacity to understand electricity at this time. He doesn't. He doesn't have the understand. I could tell him till he's blue in the face, the knowledge will fall down. Okay? Now, if he has understanding to understand flow or current, then I can add to that understanding knowledge. He has an understanding that if I put chili powder on my finger and he bites my finger, what's going to happen is he's not going to do it again. He's going he's gonna to have a capacity to say, hey, I don't like that. I don't know what it is. He doesn't have knowledge of what chili powder is, but he can learn it. So he has some small understanding. If he asks or grows up in the Lord, or as we grow up spiritually from being children and infants in the Lord, we ask God, I, I, give me understanding. God will give you that. That's your basic gift. That's your basic starter that he can give you if you ask him. And then to that, he can give you information, which is all that knowledge. Wisdom is what you do with that information. So my son now, just say he has understanding to understand the capacity of electricity. That's a zappity zap thing, right? And we start, now he gives to him knowledge. This is how flow and current work. Okay, but he's still foolish. He still puts his finger in the socket and gets electricity, electrified. If he doesn't know what to do with that information, then what good is knowledge and what good is understanding without coupled with wisdom? Okay, capacity to hold is his understanding. Knowledge, the information that goes and fits in that capacity. Wisdom is the governance and guidance of the Lord on how to use that best to best applied okay to use that best applied that information okay if we're all looking at the chart we all have the same knowledge we may have an understanding of how to draw lines we may have a knowledge of what they do but we don't know what to do about we don't know what actions to take that would be it fall under the category of wisdom I know a man who read the Bible for, I don't know, he was old, he was, I, won't, I don't want to say who he is. This man I knew for many years, I was very close to this man. But this man was not a believer. He w would read the Bible over and over again, and he read it like two or three times, but he didn't believe what he read. And it never manifested in his life. He had knowledge, but he didn't have the wisdom of God. It didn't come alive to him. It never came alive to him. I, don't, I, I can't remember if he ever got saved or not, but I did tell him about the Lord a few times and it seemed like light bulbs were clicking um, in his life toward the, end of his, toward the end of our days when I got to be with him. So I think that's going to be a similar thing to how many people are responding to the similar information. Now, God is the one who adds knowledge to those understanding. And then it says this, he reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness. We're going to come back to this at the very end of the message, okay? And light dwells within him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise. And I, you, for you have given me wisdom and might. Now, what's the difference between wisdom and might? Might is the power that comes from structural positioning of that wisdom. Okay? When you're in a strong position, you have power. Sometimes... If, for example, if it's wisdom when it comes to wealth, 
or finances and you know how to position yourself now you have power because now you're in a not a weak position you're not at the mercy of the winds of financial movements for example if you bought shiba at a very low price before it even had its last big run right if you bought shiba then any of these smaller waves don't affect you because you're in a strong position if you just got shiba yesterday it seemed like everything's affecting you right you, US, uh, Bitcoin has a few more few more down going down to go before it comes back on top of it with round action. We talked about that on Saturday. USDT has a resistance at an angle like this and price is going up and it has room to go up, which would make short term negative prices in the market. And there's a lot of people that are going to be like, Whoa! And, and, and everybody's freaking out, right? Because what's happening is we're not in a strong position if that's your if that's the case. If you're, if you don't have a firm ground or root over your home, and when you're governing your children and they don't listen to your words, you don't have might over your home, you don't have protection. If you don't have physical muscles, then an intruder comes in. You don't have might to that wisdom. You know what to do. You know how to protect, but you don't have any power to do. What good is it to have wisdom if you're not in a position to execute what you know? Okay, if God gives you all the secrets of the mystery and, and you know how to do whatever, but you don't have the right tools, you don't have the might. So God has to give you not just wisdom or first, not just understanding, not just knowledge, not just wisdom, but he also has to give you might. Right. So say I'm super smart. Right. I'm very smart, but I don't have any arms or legs. I can't even I can't even I'm like Christopher Christopher Walken, uh, uh, the Hawkins guy. I think it was his name. And he's talking like this with a button. I used to work with individuals like that. The button would go across the screen and it would flash through all the alphabet and they would hit the button. And it would, one one button, would spell it one word at a time. And it would take a guy like, what, 15 minutes just to say one sentence. It was like he was just waiting. Stop. A. B. It was like that. It was just like that. And I know those individuals. So God has to give you that mind. All right, so what am I doing by explaining all of these things from this part of Daniel? We're talking about asking God because he is the only one who can reveal mysteries. But he's also going beyond just the mystery. He's giving you capacity, understanding, knowledge, wisdom. And we have to remember a few things along the way. So again, to go back to the first part of the message, God has to elevate us. And when he elevates us, we understand that usually it's his grace and it's not just for us, but it's far beyond us, right? It's far beyond Daniel, his companions, and for the others, like Egypt. They were looking not just at their home and the Israelites and Joseph, not just looking at himself and the Israelites, but also all of Egypt and the nations that were dependent on the economy of Egypt. The famine, the ones who were suffering. They came to Egypt, all the nations of the world, which many of us wouldn't be here today in those early days if that hadn't happened. And now we're looking at the prayer of Daniel because Daniel has wisdom and he's understanding these things. He's saying, Lord, you changed the times and the seasons. Lord, you removed the powers and authorities and you set up powers and authorities, the kings. You gave wisdom to the wise. You gave knowledge to understanding. You gave us deep and hidden things. Light is within you. And then it says this. For you have given me wisdom and might, which is the structural strength, the power to do something with that wisdom. He stands before the king. He understands that, wait a minute, this is favor right here where I am. This is a, a favor. If I wasn't here, I wouldn't be able to save these people. If I was just some Joe Schmo, and if your name is Joe Schmo, please forgive me. But I'm not just some Joe Schmo who's living down on Elm Street. Okay? I, and if you live on Elm Street, also forgive me, please. Okay? I'm here right now in this time, in this season, with the king, talking with the captain of the guard, and I have favor with the captain of the guard. When we are wise, we start looking, wait a minute, where am I? Am I supposed to be here? Is this where I'm supposed to be? And if you are where you're supposed to be, then you start looking around and saying, thank you, Lord. Because if it wasn't for this, I wouldn't have the ability to do that or do such and such. For me, in my life, I'm grateful right now. I may not be rich at this moment. And one day I'm going to be very wealthy. But I think to myself, Lord, you have me in this exact position, in this exact place, in this exact city, so I can do an exact thing during this time. My wife knows what that is. 
There's been times when God sent me to different countries and different nations, and I just happened to be there at the exact moment, at that exact time, to do that exact thing that I was supposed to be at that exact moment. That was favor. That was his wisdom. That was God's might added to the wisdom. And when I was in those positions, I had an understanding that said, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be here. And you guys often look around, and you may not understand how critical some of those moments you are. Some of those, it may be a small thing you do that you don't think is very important, but it actually is very important to someone else somewhere. It may be important to someone's future. It may be important to populate heaven. It could be a very little thing, and it has a very big impact. And that's a powerful thing. You may say, well, I'm just working this job. I'm just working this job that I hate. I hate this job. But do you know that sometimes that, that in that job, there's been certain jobs that my dad worked that he got to minister to somebody. My dad hated some of the jobs he had. But he would call me and say, I got to witness to this guy. And I got to tell him the Lord. And we had a conversation. And then he runs into some of these people years later. And they're like, hey, Mike, hey, I remember that. Remember you taught me? And now I'm going to that such and such church that you were told me you were going to. And Jesus came into my life. Wow. Wow. From a job that he hated, he may not have saw that as power. He may not have saw that as might, but that was God's positioning for him. All right, let's continue. We got some ground to cover. All right, the last part. You gave me wisdom, you gave me might, and now you have made known to me what we asked. What is it saying? You answered my prayer. Because God is the one, the revealer of mysteries, who answers the prayer. And you are made known to us the king's matter. The king's matter. Now, what's the king's matter? We can translate as this, as the stuff that's important at levels of governance. You made known to us. The stuff at political levels, the stuff at high-ranking levels, the stuff that's beyond just our peasant levels, right, so to speak. It, this is the stuff that matters to the kings. This is what the things that set up kings and tear down kings. You let us know what's going on. Hallelujah that our heavenly Father is still a revealer of mysteries. I'm going to say that one more time. Our heavenly Father is still a, a revealer of mysteries who tells us what's happening at government levels. <laughs> Sorry, Roy, I'm going to mute you. <laughs> He's letting you guys know what is happening. How many times does God give a prophetic inside trading levels? From big financial institutions, what they're doing. Or tell us what's happening in the banking stuff. Or help, helping us know what the future targets are. Or That happens a lot, and especially in our community. And in chart room. This type of stuff is happening at God levels. What's happening with the presidents? Who Do we need to pray for the president today? Do we need to pray for such and such? What's happening with the nation? What's going to happen in the season? What are they trying? What are they going to do to us? What are they trying to do these things? And the Lord starts giving you visions and dreams and prophetic. Can we hear it over and over? And it usually matches intel. And it starts painting a story. And then with that story, we can pray. With that story, we can actually start changing things. And that's what happens. Now, that's a powerful thing. Revealer of mysteries. Daniel's book is very prevalent to what is happening today. Let's continue. Then Arach, the captain, brought in Daniel before the king in haste. It says, Thus he said to him, I found among the exec exiles from Judah a man who made known to the king the interpretation. The king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belteshar, Are you... Able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and make known its interpretation? And Daniel says, No. Are you able to do it? Is it me? Do you got the power? Are you the one that can tell me what I dream? And Daniel says, No. I can't do it. No wise man can do it. No enchanter, no magicians. Our astrologers can show the king the mystery that the king has asked. No one. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And he has made known to, the, to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. He's saying, I can't do it because it doesn't come from me. I recognize I'm not the source. You got a dream, right? I didn't give you that dream. I'm just me. But God gave you that dream. And if anyone knows the mystery, it's God. It's Him. 
and his source. And yeah, what you asked is not good because guess what? You ask them to do something that only God can do. You're looking at man's way and you need to be looking God's way. When God rises you up, my friends, to go out to evangelize or to the world or to communities and to, when you're talking about Jesus, we always got to we always got to remember where we end and God begins. And if you ever don't know what to do, point the way to the Lord. There's a lot of people that try to look at men when they were when Peter and uh, John went out evangelizing they fell at their feet and they were like, oh, and then Peter said, stand up. I'm a man just like you. I'm a man just like you. We're on that same level, buddy. But you got to go to Jesus. He's the king. He's the king. I'm, I'm a nobody, but he's the king. He even said this, silver and gold I don't have, but he does. He's the king. Silver and gold I don't have, but he has your answer to your prayer. I know that you're asking for silver and gold, but what you really need is a miracle. And he says, what I have, I'll give you in Jesus' name, rise. And he rises them up. I'm not the source, but I know where the source comes from. And because I know where it comes from, the power flows through me. Who said it best? I'll tell you who said it best. The centurion said it best. He says this. He understood it. Matthew 8, 9, he says, I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. I say to this man, go, and he goes. Another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. And so what he's saying is, look, I'm under authority. I obey. I'm not the source. I'm underneath the source. I'm underneath the power. And I have power that flows through me. And I understand how it works. And then Jesus says, Jesus heard it. He marveled. And he said to them, Why early I say unto you, I have not found faith so great, not in all Israel. Wow. To this soldier man. Now why that soldier man? Because the soldier man understood how the flow of power works. All right. Let's say a closing prayer for today. Father, we thank you for this wonderful seasons that you have been giving us. We may not always understand everything, but we know that we can ask you, Father. I pray that we would recognize when we are placed in places that we can see the opportunities that be, are before us to water the fields that you have planted or to plant seeds where water needs to happen. I pray that we would be people who plant seeds. As the Bible says, one plants a seed and one waters. I pray that we'd be people who water. Lord, I pray that we would also have it revealed to us the purposes on why we are in the places we are. If you rise us up to be in king's palaces, if you raise us up to be in the prison, if you raise us up to be at the bottom of the well, whatever the case is, may we prosper where we're at and may we thrive where we are and may we have understanding and to that understanding may we add knowledge and to that knowledge may we receive wisdom and to that wisdom may we receive might. Lord, I pray, Lord, that we would be people like Daniel who would give glory to you the moment you reveal wisdom, the moment that, the moment that you reveal mysteries, and that we would point others towards you and, uh, in, uh, and illuminate you and your voice to others who are trying to connect to you. As uh, Daniel said, that this is to show you your thoughts. This is between you. And as uh, he was showing him what God has revealed, the king saw this through your glory, through your miracle. As Philip said to the Ethiopian, do you understand what God is giving you right here? Do you understand what God is speaking to you? I pray that we would be people that would be the type that would want to and desire, have the ability and capacity to explain the mysteries of God. May we explain to the nations you. May we preach and proclaim Christ, Him crucified. May we proclaim what God is doing in their lives and in their seasons. Because ultimately, even all of those little things that you're doing in the nations, in the life, in cryptocurrencies, even all of those things lead back to Christ. 
Some people are wondering what God is doing in their finances. We can be a people that can use that to point them back to Christ. You used external events, kingdom events, dreams to show yourself to a man who didn't have anything to do with you. Who took your articles of silver and put them in the temple of his gods. And the treasury of his gods. His foreign gods. And yet you still loved him enough to minister to him even on his bed. He wasn't a believer. But you were still giving him prophetic dreams. And you used the believers to point him back to you. I pray that you would do the same things now. That you would minister to us the ability and give us the ability to lead others to Christ through what you're doing in the world. Through what you're doing in politics. Through what you're doing in finances. What you're doing in cryptocurrencies. What you're doing in the dreams. What you're doing uh, on the news. And at every turn, they would keep turning back to you. Trying to find you. And we would be there to help them. For you said in the word of God. You said, the harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. So therefore pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into the fields to harvest those. Father, may we ask right now, please send more people into the fields to evangelize the lost, to seek them, to bring them to Christ, to explain to them what Christ is doing, to explain to them what God is doing, or... At the very least, to point them back towards the way, towards you. Back home. To show them. People who've never met you before, they're waking up because of all these external events. And in this case, these external events are powerful then. Because you have used them to humble kings. To humble the mighty in the land. You've humbled them and you've brought them to the point where they are now in a position to look at the cross. Sometimes you weaken them just to make them strong. You bring down those nations. Praise God, because with you they can become strong. And we the same way, Father. I pray, Lord, that you would reveal to us what it is you're doing. And now I will say I will say what the Lord has shown me before the message. The Lord has shown me this. The Lord has shown me that He's dipping into the darkness. In illuminating the light. And I'm prophesying. The Lord is dipping his hand into the darkness. He's illuminating that darkness with the deepest. And he's pulling out the mysteries. He's pulling out the secrets that have been hidden. And he's giving them to you. This is what the Lord said to me before the message started. He Showed me a great darkness and his hand, a hand, a very large hand, dipping in. The hand of God dipping into that darkness, shining light like if it was a basket of secrets. And he's taking out those secrets and he's giving them to you. Lord, we receive those secrets. Dip into your, dip into your mysteries, Lord, and reveal them to us, your servants. Dip into your mysteries. I was excited to share this prophecy with what you showed me before the message. And what a timely message because this is the message from today. This is what you're doing in the book of Daniel. But it also is what you're doing now in these times and in these seasons. Even in my own life, Lord, you're revealing this this profound secrets and mysteries that no man could think of. You are revealing them. And I pray that you would just continue to reveal all of your mysteries and secrets to your servants, Lord. May we be faithful keepers of those secrets. May we be faithful stewards of your finance. May we be faithful to follow and be obedient. Help us to understand what it is you're doing. And keep giving us more and more. And we will open our hands. And I want you guys to do this as an act of faith. I want you to, wherever you are, open your hands and say, Lord... I receive your mysteries. Lord, give me your mysteries. Lord, I receive your mysteries. Say it with me. Lord, give me your mysteries. Lord, I receive your mysteries. Through your counsel, Lord, you've given us this ability. Thank you, Lord. Through your counsel, you've given us this ability 
and your ministry so that, that we could prosper, so that we can seek and save the lost, so that we could be preserved, so that we can fulfill our purposes, just like you gave to Solomon, the great wisdom, so that he can uh, prosper, so that he can uh, govern his people. You did it all because you were thinking about others. So, Lord, use what you put in our hands for others. What Put what's in our hands so that our children can be preserved. So that the people, even the people who are not believers, that one day will find you. We'll lay a foundation in the spirit. We'll lay a foundation in the physical. We'll lay a foundation among the nations. That they, and those who come past, whether it's to now, in this month, in the seasons, or for generations to come, we will lay foundations that they will be safe or they will be saved. Make us unto people who build cities of refuge. Make us unto people who build uh, places of, of refuge. Uh, make us unto a people that use the wisdom of God to navigate the future. The times are in your hands. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Amen.